Yes. What I saw was a high level of logistical organization. Latin America specialist Joseph Humeyer, who was on the ground with Guatemalan intelligence 10 days ago, said some caravans operate in a military fashion. So one of the things that we're hearing now is that there is a dramatic increase in the number of Venezuelan caravans um, on the U.S.-Mexico border or on their way, on their way to the border. Uh, talk to us about why we're seeing this influx now from Venezuela. The reason I wrote this column was because I came across research that was done by and the Center for a Secure Free Society, which did the work on the flights, uh, also says that um, that there are NGOs there that are. Uh, basically allied with Venezuela that are helping people get through the Darien Gap. That's a very active um, process of, of pushing migrants to the U.S. border. And I would call that weaponization. It has overwhelmed U.S. law enforcement at the U.S. border. And so today, this is a good reason why we have this organization and why you are here tonight. I have to say, Mario Vargas Llosa, the Peruvian poet, once said that uncertainty is a flower whose petals have yet to be picked. Well, there's someone tonight who can begin to pick those petals. His knowledge of the area is nearly unmatched he was trained to be tough and aggressive by the United States Marine Corps. Ladies and gentlemen, Joseph Humeyer. But I thought it was fitting, and I think you can't have a conversation today about the Western Hemisphere without talking about the crisis on the U.S. southern border. It's at the top of the mind of all Americans, Americans that don't pay attention to foreign policy and national security. We're in a bit of an anomaly here. In, in Washington, D.C. And what I'd like to do for the next 15 minutes or so is I'd like to unpack this crisis that we have on the U.S. southern border uh, to make it evident that this is the number one national security crisis of our lifetime. And I would argue, actually, many of you from Latin America, this is the number one crisis of your country as well. It's what I call the three crises in one. You have a capacity crisis, you have a political crisis, and you have a national security crisis. I'm going to unpack that, and then I'm going to share some stories about, as you can tell in the video, some of the experiences I've had visiting several borders in the Western Hemisphere and the world. Let's start with the capacity crisis, because I have a lot of libertarian friends, classical liberal friends. I come from a classical tradition, just like Alex Shafuen, and, and the founding of SFS comes from this tradition. And a lot of my libertarian friends would often remind me, say, Joseph, are you now against immigration? And I think it's pretty obvious I'm not against immigration. I wouldn't be here if I was against immigration. But that said, I said I'm for ordered migration. It is undoubtedly true that migrants help a society. They help bring ideas, and ideas lead to innovation, and innovation leads to wealth creation. Economics 101 will teach you that. But not all at the same time. The capacity crisis is a crisis in which our border infrastructure, both in terms of personnel and resources, is collapsing before our very eyes. On any given day, from the San Ysidro port in California to the Eagle Pass port of entry in Texas to the Rio Grande, on average, there is about the capacity to withstand 1,500 to 1,600 encounters per day. CPB, Customs and Border Patrol, measures encounters, not individuals, because it could be the same individual that comes on repeated attempts. Nonetheless, it taxes the same capacity. So 15 to 1,600 per day. The numbers for CPB of physical year 22, 2022, were 2.7 million encounters per day. If you do the math, that's over 7,000 encounters on average per day. That is four times our capacity. That means we do not have the ability to screen, to vet, to have ordered migration into the United States. That means there's a, a slew of people that will get in, both good and bad, that we don't even know who they are. They call them gotaways in the Department of Homeland Security. So regardless of your thinking about migrants, this is not a, a, a conversation just about migrants. It's a conversation about border capacity, border infrastructure, border resources. 
Well, that's the capacity crisis. Well, let's talk about the political crisis. And this is not a partisan statement. It's not a partisan statement. The uh, uptick of mass migration at the U.S. southern border, you can go back to 2014 with the unaccompanied minors. That There was definitely signs that this was increasing. But more recently, it actually started to begin to rise in 2018. So it wasn't this administration that had to deal with this initially. It was the previous administration, the Trump administration. 2019 was on pace to be the largest uh, rate of migration to the U.S. southern border, except they were able to get a handle on it. What did they do? Well, they used a lot of political capital to do two specific policies. One is called the Migration Protection Protocol, otherwise known as the Remain in Mexico policy. And the other one is called the Third Country Safe Agreements. What this means, this is not a solution to the situation that we're facing, but it was a temporary fix to be able to slow the rate of migration, to be able to deal with the first problem, which is capacity. In January of 2021, both of those policies were rescinded. Now, my point to this is not to make any part of the statement. My point to this is to say is every policy decision at this magnitude, whether you implement this or whether you rescind it, needs to be a discussion. It needs to be held with all the decision makers, including the legislative branch, the executive branch, to take into account what this policy can actually affect. By rescinding this policy, we essentially removed the band-aid that was there temporarily, and the numbers speak for themselves. 2021 was the largest uh, year for record on rate until 2022, fiscal year, and, and 2022 is uh, the 2.7 million encounters per day, and that has now uh, become the not record. We'll see what happens with fiscal year 2023. It's on pace to surpass 2022, but we will see. But then I'll move to the national security crisis, because really th those are the elements of the U.S. southern border that I think are the most understood, but sometimes the national security elements are the ones least discussed and least understood. I'll begin with one word, which is fentanyl. Now, I am not an expert on fentanyl or, or drug overdoses or, or things like that. I've spoken with other experts. I, I'll be honest with you, I didn't even know what fentanyl really was until a few years ago, and it was introduced to us through through what's happening in, in many suburban neighborhoods and urban neighborhoods throughout the country. I did not know that it's only two milligrams of fentanyl has the potency to kill an individual depending on that individual. But what I'm most concerned about with when it comes to fentanyl isn't necessarily see the potency of the fentanyl because I feel like that's something that will probably get adjusted. I don't believe that drug cartels are out to kill their customers. What I'm most concerned about is the convergence of networks between bankers and facilitators and brokers from China, cartels from Mexico, and middlemen, facilitators throughout the process that are making a boatload of money off of this illicit business. But fentanyl is just one part of the equation. The other part of the equation is human smuggling. U.S. Southern Command in 2020 reported that in one year, they were able to, along with our partners in Latin America, to detain and arrest 66 human smuggling facilitators. What is that? What's a human, smu human smuggling facilitator as an individual or a network that facilitates the movement of migrants from all over the world to specific destinations, in this case, to the U.S. southern border. On average, a human smuggling facilitator can profit upwards to $150 million per year. One facilitator. That's, that seems like a, it's a mega business. They arrested 66 in 2020, which is the year of the pandemic. You do the math, that's more than $9 billion of an operation. And that's just in what they caught in Latin America. There's other human smuggling facilitators in other parts of the world. So it's not just drugs. It's also human smuggling. And it's how illicit networks are starting to come together and overpower economies. I mean, they're not a GDP that can match the amount of rate of growth of illicit enterprise. And what happens when you have illicit enterprise grow, the former enterprise gets weakened. And at some pace, at some way, the incentives change. And what would otherwise be an individual that would be a productive member of society becomes a predatory member of society because he goes toward the incentives. That's also economics 101. So that's the, the border crisis, at least the way I view it. I view it as three crises in one that is really creating a challenge that's in many ways unprecedented to what we've seen here in the United States.
Well, let me give you a, a bit of an anecdote of one of the investigations that we've done at SFS. Now, as you can see in the video, uh, we pride ourselves on doing field research. I live, in, I live in the Washington metro area. I study a lot about what's happening in the region. I've learned from a lot of you about what's happening in Latin America. But I like to visit the countries that we research to get a sense of what's happening on the ground. So let me take us back to October of 2018. I was in Guatemala. And if you remember, this was when the Central American caravans began to rise. I was there for a completely different purpose. I was there actually because I was uh, providing a, a training to the Guatemalan military. But the uh, Central American, <coughs> sorry, the Central American caravans from Honduras began to move on October 12th. It was 180 migrants to begin with, 180 Hondurans specifically on October 12th. By October 20th, in eight days, that ballooned up to more than 7,000. That, that didn't seem normal. That, that wasn't normal. Like what? Nothing changed. There wasn't a war that broke out. There wasn't an earthquake, natural disaster. Seven thousand Hondurans didn't just wake up one day. So you know what? I don't like the food. I'm out of here. Let's go. Something happened. So we decided to look at what happened. We. Uh, I'm going to give you the very cliff notes, the the upshot of what of what we found. There's actually a report on our website called Central American Caravans. If you want to read more details. But the upshot is we looked at two things. We looked at the route and the composition. Let me talk about the route. Because the Central American caravans in 2018, they did not take the shortest physical route to the uh, to Mexico. They did not take the uh, fastest route, which would have been the Pan American Highway. They took the longest and the slowest route. Why? They took that route because there had already been infrastructure developed by NGOs to be able to attend to thousands of migrants. They're going to need medical attention, food, shelter, water. And so we started to look at some of these uh, NGOs, and we found one that was called Pueblo Sin Fronteras. And let me be careful how I say this, because most of the NGOs were not politicized. Most of them were doing humanitarian work. They're attending to migrants, which is what they uh, exist for. But there were some, such as Pueblo Sin Fronteras, that were under the shield of doing humanitarian work, but in actually were doing political work, and were politicizing the narratives around the movement of mass migration to talk about how border security and border infrastructure are crimes against humanity. But when we dug a little further, and this is the kicker, when we dug a little further, because every investigation has another layer deep, we found that the, the, the Pueblo Sin Fronteras migrant caravans began in, in San Pedro Sula, Honduras, through suitcases of cash that came from the Nicolas Maduro regime in Venezuela. Now, maybe for this audience that might be obvious, for me, that caught me a bit by surprise because I wanted to ask the question of what does Venezuela care about Central American migrants? Why do they care about the U.S. southern border? And this is in 2018, a little bit. There, there wasn't Venezuelans arriving at the U.S. southern border at that time. And what I came to realize was it's not the purpose of the mass migration from the Central American caravans was not to get a bunch of Central Americans into the United States. It was just to get them to the border, to be able to tax the capacity at the border to be able to drive a narrative that would be able to create uh, all kinds of incentives and different kinds of political change. And it was meant to create a sort of sense of chaos that would weaken your control of your sovereign state. Let me, with the few minutes that remain, let me take you to what is the worst border in the Western Hemisphere, another border that I visited uh, in recent years, which is the border of Colombia, Venezuela, because be, believe it or not, the, our U.S. southern border, as bad as it sounds, is not as bad as some of the borders that you can see throughout the Western Hemisphere or even the world. Now, I, I was able to visit the Colombia-Venezuela border on three occasions over the last two years. And I say it's the most dangerous border in the Western Hemisphere because of what I saw when I went to the Colombia-Venezuelan border wasn't just the, the fightings of different factions of the FARC or the uh, different elements of illicit trade and illicit actors that are fighting over territorial control. But I say it's the most dangerous border because what I saw was Russian radar systems, very sophisticated Russian radar systems moving along the Venezuelan side of the border, sucking up the communications of the Colombian military that were patrolling that border. I saw Iranian-made surveillance drones that were doing low-level overflights. The thing with drones is that airspace is usually only controlled, and you correct me if I'm wrong, but around 700 feet and above, anything that flies below that is not clear whose airspace that is. Well, these Iranian flights would get very close. Iranian-made drones get very close to that airspace. 
So Chinese satellites that were being operated out of a military facility in Guarico in the central part of Venezuela. What I saw when I visited the Colombia-Venezuelan borders, I saw great power competition emerging on a border that really the world really wasn't paying attention to. So this process of going from a humanitarian crisis through mass migration that then turns into a conflict among illicit actors, drug cartels, human smugglers, all fighting for control of the illicit trade, that booming business, to then the external actors then controlling elements of what's happening along that border, that process seemed very clear to me of how Colombia was devolving into something that can later be a target of opportunity for an autocratic, if not totalitarian regime. Our border is following that same process. We have to be very keen to what's happening on our USM board because it's not happening by mistake. It's not happening because it's just all of a sudden migrants are coordinating in a very inorganic manner. There's a term for this, and it's not my term. I didn't come up with this. There was actually a professor from Tufts University, Dr. Kelly Greenhill, who wrote a, her thesis, then a book about this process. She called it coerced engineered migration. I call this strategic engineered mass migration, which I think we need to separate from organic migration, which has been happening for a long time. Strategic engineered migration is when, when migration is catalyzed and or induced and manipulated by state or non-state actors who are trying to use coercion and subversion with political and geopolitical objectives against a targeted state or government. That's how Dr. Kelly Greenhill, in paraphrasing, would define it. And I think that that's a concept that we need to adapt to be able to understand the problems that are happening at the Western Hemisphere. It's happening on the U.S. southern border. It's happening on the Colombia-Venezuela border. It's happening on the Darien Gap. It's happening on the Bolivia-Peru border. It's happening on the other side of the Venezuelan border with Guyana. It's happening even in maritime borders on the water. Why would borders become so important? Well, what I argue is that you know, we have this conversation here in Washington a lot about democracies versus authoritarians. We're going to have that conversation tonight. I think the next panel is going to talk a lot about this. And they sometimes equate that to the challenges that we face during the 20th century of socialism versus capitalism. But it's very different because in the 20th century, there were countries in governments that would raise the communist flag around the world and say, follow us. This is the way. This system of governance, this political economic system is the way to go. They lost, but there's no one in the world that raises the authoritarian flag. There's no one that says we're a proud authoritarian, follow our way of governing. The most authoritarian nation states in the world, what do they call themselves? Democracies. But the conversation about democracy has to go deeper than just talking about what's on the surface of democracy. If you study democracy, and there's plenty of democracy scholars in this room, so I feel very much uh, like I would learn from you about democracy. But the, 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 the evolution of democracy really took its leap forward af after the birth of the sovereign nation state. After the 30 year war, 1648 and the peace of Westphalia, had it not been for that concept of the sovereignty and of nation state sovereignty, perhaps democracies would have never had its day. So the conversation about democracy today is not just a conversation about elections, about free speech. Those are important things, but it's a conversation about sovereignty over your nation state. And that includes the U.S. southern border. 